Now we're going to have another change of pace and uh, move on to the uh, Nobel Peace Prize. Um, this talk will be given by Daniel Kinderman, uh, who is on the, uh, an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science and International Relations. He earned his PhD at Cornell University and then uh, did postdoctoral uh, fellowship at the New School for Social Research. He came to UD at the beginning of 2011, and his research concerns the politics of corporate social responsibility. Now, when um, the Nobel Prize was announced, uh, uh, Daniel's department chair, uh, within moments, sent me an email saying, you know, in our department, we have an expert on the European Union. And I quoted this back to Daniel tonight, and he said, well, I'm, I'm married to a European. Uh, I, I, there's somewhere between those, I think, uh, is the, the real case. And we'll look forward to hearing uh, what he has to say about the Nobel Peace Prize this year. Thank you very much. And in, indeed, I'm the only non-EU citizen in, in my family. My, my wife and both of our kids are, are EU citizens. This much is clear. The Nobel Peace Prize is inherently uh, controversial. Because of its controversial nature, the Peace Prize um, cannot be discussed, I believe, in the same way as the other uh, prizes um, can be discussed. So my talk will be uh, somewhat different uh, from the preceding ones. Uh, you'll, you'll, you'll soon see. In fact, the Nobel, Peace, uh, the Nobel Committee has come under quite a lot of criticism for its decision to award the Peace Prize to the European Union this year, in 2012. The decision has been touted as a complete and utter joke. It has been greeted with incredulity and outrage. Why? While it is hard to deny that the EU has contributed to peace, reconciliation, democracy, and human rights in Europe and beyond during the past 60 years, the award comes at a time of profound crisis for the EU. The financial crisis that began in 2007 has, a major, has had a major impact on the Eurozone through the sovereign debt crisis, which is, which is ongoing. Around the time that the prize was announced, in fact, may, many of you may have seen a TV footage of uh, people rioting uh, on the streets uh, of, of Spain and of Greece. Because the prize is so political, is inherently political, and because this award in particular was highly political, I feel it's very important for me to address these issues in my talk. So I will discuss reasons why the European Union should not be thought of as a worthy recipient of the Peace Prize, as well as reasons why the European Union genuinely deserves this award. For those of you not familiar with uh, the history of 20th century Europe and of the EU, the EU originated 60 years ago in the aftermath of industrial genocide and some of the most savage episodes of collective, collective violence in the recorded history of the human species. In 1946, Winston Churchill reflected on the tragedy of Europe a continent that had been the fountain of Christianity and of great achievements in art, philosophy, and science was now populated by a vast quivering mass of tormented, hungry, careworn, and bewildered human beings gaping at the ruins of their cities and homes and scanning the dark horizons for the approach of some new peril, tyranny, or terror. At the beginning of the 1950s, thanks to the initiative of two visionary and politically astute Frenchmen, Jacques Delors and Robert, um, sorry, Jean Monnet and Robert Schumann, Jacques Delors came a few decades later, um, six West European countries agreed to give up national control over coal and steel, two industries that were essential for waging war, to a supranational authority. That was the beginning of what we today call the European Union. Today, the EU is a family of 27 countries with about half a billion people. EU member countries sign treaties, um, sign up to a body of treaties, legislation and norms, and move together towards an ever closer union with a set of common values based on democracy and human rights. In addition to engaging in free trade with each other, EU member states give up or pool sovereignty in a number of areas. They act collectively through an institutionalized system of decision making, uh, which, the Euro, which the Euro, most Europeans, by the way, don't understand uh, very well at all um, how the Euro 
how the, how the European Union uh, actually functions. The past 60 years, the era of the EU, mark a clear and decisive break with Europe's history of cruelty and violence. Presenting the award in Oslo, Nobel Committee Chairman Torbjörn Jagland said that the EU has transformed most of Europe from a continent of wars to a continent of peace. The member states of the EU have been at peace with each other since the EU's establishment uh, 60 years ago. The EU has consolidated peace between France and Germany, who have fought many wars. It has supported and consolidated democracy in the former dictatorships in southern Europe of Greece, Spain, and Portugal, and in Eastern European countries emerging from the disintegrating Soviet bloc. As well, the Nobel Committee mentions uh, the EU's activities in Yug former Yugoslavia and in Turkey. Given these seemingly undeniable achievements, why do some people think that giving the award to the EU was a mistake? Well, for many Europeans, peace does not simply mean the absence of war, it also means social peace. And the turmoil unleashed by the financial and Eurozone crisis is causing unprecedented social hardships in Europe. Indeed, the current crisis threatens to undermine the social contract that is the foundation of many European societies. During her recent visit to Greece, German Chancellor Merkel was welcomed on the streets by protesters dressed in Nazi uniforms. The current situation in uh, Spain and Greece to mention just two, two countries, is extremely volatile and the hardships uh, that people there are enduring are, are considerable. So for many commentators, it is absolutely farcical to give the European Union a Nobel Peace Prize under these circumstances. Secondly, critics point out that the Nobel Prize has neglected the role of American power and the NATO alliance in post-war Europe. Part of the reason for peace in the post-war period was not the EU at all. It was the Marshall Plan and raw American military power which shielded the EU member states from the Soviet threat with NATO's nuclear umbrella. And finally, even abstracting from the current impasse, one may wonder how a Nobel Peace Prize can be reconciled with the European Union's failure to act, failure to intervene in the genocide in its very own backyard in the former Yugoslavia in the 1990s. And of course, um, the United States uh, intervened there. Given these, scathe, given these scathing criticisms, what do we make of the Nobel Committee's decision to award the Nobel Peace Prize to the European Union? Are there any reasons at all why we might welcome it? Well, uh, to start, uh, the member states of the EU have been at peace since the EU was established, since the European Coal and Steel Community was established 60 years ago. Given the continent's history of wars, this is no small achievement. Europeans have taken, uh, taken steps towards denationalization, towards weakening their attachment to, uh, uh, their territorial attachment, um, weakening uh, uh, existing territorial ties. Although it's true that European identity is weak, a significant number of Europeans do identify themselves both with their member country, with uh, their, their home country in the EU, and with Europe or the EU more generally. There are a number of examples of policies that I think uh, would be of interest and relevant to, uh, to college students, including the EU's Erasmus Student Exchange, uh, which approximately three million European students have used to date. And this student exchange enables students to travel to and study in another EU country. And I think it's pretty obvious if you think about it how a policy like this um, would result in social ties um, and familiarity, uh, perhaps friends, um, perhaps even more than that, uh, family, transnational families. Um, and these kinds of ties um, will uh, almost by definition promote peace and prevent conflict between these countries. And these policies would not exist or at least not exist in the same way as they do without the EU. Although the global trend seems to be towards an increase in civil wars and uh, uh, intrastate violence, 
uh, the danger of, uh, of conflicts between states can never be ruled out. There's no guarantee that, uh, that these kinds of wars uh, won't, won't uh, pop up again, and the EU can be seen as a bulwark against this danger. Does the EU deserve all the credit for the peace in Europe during the past 60 years? Certainly not. But it deserves some credit. The Nobel Committee can justifiably claim that the EU's long-run achievements in this area deserve some recognition. Our perceptions are inherently biased towards the latest news headlines. We tend to overlook and take for granted slow-moving slow -moving developments. And many of the EU's achievements are the result of these slow-moving processes. But why then has the, has the peace award been awarded to the EU now in the EU's darkest hour? The Nobel Prize Committee makes explicit reference to the EU's current troubles. So it wasn't just an accident. It wasn't just that they couldn't find anyone, to, anyone else to give the prize to. They acknowledge the EU's grave economic difficulties and considerable social unrest, um, and that this could be understood um, I believe that this could be understood as a plea or a petition for the EU to get the crisis under control. One uh, person I will mention is the German philosopher Jürgen Habermas, who has mentioned, who has written that the Nobel Peace Prize is a double appeal. On one hand, to European leaders to save a union that's broken down. On the other hand, an appeal to citizens to show solidarity just as the crisis is undermining the European social model. Reconciling the demands of financial markets with the demands of democratic legitimacy and social peace is hard enough to achieve right now in a single country. Just witness our own challenges in this area. So doing it in a union of 27 extremely diverse countries, compare Luxembourg, uh, I believe the richest country per capita in the world, with Bulgaria and Romania that are also EU members and are, are rather poor. Um, it gives you a sense of how challenging it is for the EU to deal with many of these issues because these countries have to act collectively. The current crisis is a tremendous hardship for many Europeans, and if unchecked, um, this crisis threatens to unravel the European project. But it could also turn out to be a productive crisis if it prompts European leaders to find political solutions to the problems they now face. The EU itself emerged from a crisis, and it, in, in the past it has managed uh, to uh, emerge from, from crises with renewed strength, so one may be hopeful. Critics are right that the EU has made mistakes. It has. Some of its institutions, I'm thinking in particular uh, of the, the euro, contain, contain serious design flaws. EU leaders, in conjunction with EU member countries, have no choice but to urgently address these issues. Unfortunately, these kinds of problems, economic problems, perhaps legitimacy problems, perhaps structural problems uh, of modern capitalist economies are very widespread in the world today. It's not just a matter of, Euro, uh, of, of, the, of Europe and the Euro. Um, I sometimes remind people uh, who are uh, focused a lot uh, on Europe um, uh, to look here at home at developments here in the United States where many institutions are dysfunctional. Uh, um, and uh, uh, I remind people that the financial crisis was America's gift to the world. And it's not clear when we in the United States will fully recover uh, from, from that crisis, despite enjoying a number of privileges that are unique in the world. For example, uh, the world's reserve currency in the form of the dollar. While many of the critiques of the Nobel Committee's decision are valid and indeed biting, none of them build into an indictment of the European Union per se. Nor is it apparent that those critics have answers to many or even any of the pressing problems that confront Europeans, let alone humanity as a whole. Those who think that renationalization is the way forward must confront the legacy of nationalism, which is ambivalent to say the least. Indeed, one could argue that many of the EU's problems, including those with the euro, have been caused by politicians from EU member states pandering to short-sighted national egoisms. Whether more of that national egoism 
especially uh, the kind of national egoism that you see in the form of a kind of populist Euroscepticism will resolve the problems that European citizens are facing right now, uh, I think is, is rather doubtful. To conclude, the award seems to be an attempt to give the EU some much needed recognition during a very difficult time. It may be an attempt to give an impetus to the EU to take new measures to ensure social peace uh, during these difficult times. In other words, the purpose of the prize is not to praise the current policies of the EU. The prize serves to praise the EU's past efforts for peace, reconciliation, democracy, and human rights, and the ideals of visionaries including Jean Monnet, uh, Robert Schumann, and the other person I mentioned before when I shouldn't have, Jacques Delors, um, who was a very important president of the European Commission. These are not the best of times, but the historical record suggests that they could get much worse. The EU should interpret the prize as an impetus to renew its mission. There is no shortage of things to be done. Thank you. The questions for Daniel. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, if, you, if you read the announcement, I think between the lines you can see there are very clear references to uh, the hardships and problems that have been caused as a result of the euro, which is, in a sense, you could say almost an official flagship policy of the European Union. So the euro is not the EU, and I think that you're absolutely correct. If the euro tanks, I'm not sure it will, um, but if it does, that isn't the end of the European Union. I think it's very important to distinguish between the two. However, they are connected. Um, and I think that um, the committee did, uh, did sort of uh, connect, connect them as well um, in their acknowledgement. So in, in this country, right, we have poor regions and wealthy regions. Yes. And the wealthy regions tend to transfer resources to the poorer regions. Yes. Uh, one thing that distinguishes the European Union is that they don't have that kind of a tight political or economic integration. And political sovereignty tends to overrule uh, the need for sort of economic uh, egalitarianism. So, I mean, do you, you think then, for your comments about the Euro, are you, are you thinking that the European Union doesn't need to try to have a, a more tightly integrated economy? Or should they try to follow a model that's closer to what we do in the United States? Well, this is a highly political question. And there are people who are absolutely in favor of the United States of Europe and think that the current crisis will move European Union member states much closer together and perhaps will move the EU towards the United States of Europe. And I think that there are signs that they're moving towards a more federal um, uh, uh, system right now, um, giving, giving many more uh, responsibilities uh, to Brussels uh, than has been the case before. But before, things like fiscal policy were, uh, at the, were national responsibilities and, and, and not dealt with at the supranational level. Although the EU did try to uh, equalize, um, help out poor regions, for example, through structural funds, um, the poorer EU member states uh, do, do get uh, uh, subsidies and infrastructure to try to help them to get them uh, up to speed uh, with the other members. And in terms of the, the, the solidarity, the issue of solidarity, I think uh, part of the European self-identity, at least uh, Northwestern Europe, um, not necessarily Southern Europe and certainly not the UK, is um, a sense that redistribution, high levels of redistribution are, are very, very important, but of course that's based at the national level. So um, it's not Europe-wide. Uh, people are very clear on helping out other people within their own country. Um, Germans, uh, during the past uh, months and years, have been reluctant to send billions of euros to um, a Greek government that seems to be um, not very well run or, or managed or efficient. Uh, so absolutely, you're, you're right that that, that, that that sense of solidarity is underdeveloped so far. That's absolutely true. All right. Well, let's thank Daniel again. Thank you. Thank you.